to the Bullington Capital Report, hosted by Bill Bullington. For the next hour, you'll receive information on current market conditions and trends that could affect your financial future. If you have a question, you can participate in today's program by calling 216-901-0945. That's 216-901-0WHK. You can also reach Bill by going to his website, BullingtonCapital.com. And now, here's Bill Bullington. Well, welcome back. <clears throat> wow. A little rainy out there today. I have to uh, tell you guys, I'm actually pre-recording this show, and I'm going to be talking about some stocks, so I thought I would let you know about that. Uh, it's not like these stocks were just yesterday. They were the day before yesterday. <laughs> really weird to say that in advance. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I thought I would talk about a few things today. I had a... Uh, um, interesting email. Somebody wanted me to talk more about individual stocks because that's what they like to listen to on the show. So what I thought I would do is going forward, uh, the last 15 minute segment, there are three 15 minute segments, uh, roughly on my show, the last 15 minute segment, I'm going to just, um, talk about stocks almost exclusively. And it's something that I like doing it's something that I've done my entire career. And uh, so I'll bring that back and, and start to share that. I was a little upset that I was spending so much time talking about annuities. And uh, this is a late development. So I'm, I'm still going to talk about them. But I'll, I'll bring like the first 15 minutes or so. I'll just talk about that and, and try to give you some ideas. Because the vast majority of people, the vast majority of wealth in the country is held by people who are older. Uh, I think it's uh, above the age of 60. I forget what the actual numbers are, but it, it's just suffice to say it's a large number. And when you get to that point, it, it's very important. The fixed income has always been an important part of everybody's portfolios. Back in the days when you could get a, a 6% or better tax-free bond, it was a huge part of people's portfolios. So those don't exist anymore. In fact, the interest rates are so low and there's a pretty good chance that they're going to stay fairly low for an extremely long time period. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later on in today's show. But the, uh, at, at current interest rates being so low, the one of the few viable alternatives, I think, uh, for a portion of someone's portfolio that used to have government bonds or tax-free bonds or corporate bonds in it is to take a, uh, a fixed index annuity. I think it makes a tremendous amount of sense. It's not for everybody. In fact, when you're listening to my show, I'm not making a broad recommendation that any single product should be in anyone's portfolio. I don't know. I'm just talking about the features and the benefits of various products and uh, so that you can get more knowledge about them, more information. And I try to make it relevant. You know, what, what is happening today? What do we see happening right now? Well, today we see interest rates that are extremely low. We see a stock market whose valuations are high, no doubt. They're not super cheap. Uh, some areas are, are still pretty cheap, but not all of them. And so if you are getting close to or are already retired and are taking income out of your portfolio, then this is for you. And incidentally, that makes up the vast majority of my client base as people who are nearing or are already retired. So I'm going to spend some time talking about the economy, about what kinds of things are going on. I'm, I'm extremely excited about what I've seen developing in the last few years. And this is not a, uh, um, you know, one of the, one of the issues I think novice investors have is they come into the financial markets and they think that they should be able to predict what's going to happen over the next six to 12 months. And, you know, it's just not going to happen. I mean, and, and if you do, one of the worst things that can happen is that you get lucky and you get it right because now you think you have talent <laughs> and you're going to figure out very quickly that you weren't talented and that you were just lucky. Well, actually, maybe not even that quickly. I've, I've seen so many instances where people made an investment. The investment worked so well for so long, and then it crashed. And it's, a, it's very sad to see that. 
So it, it, it's very easy, super simple to confuse luck with skill in the stock, especially in the stock market. And oftentimes people won't find out that they didn't really have any skills and that they were lucky until it was too late. And I've seen some people that were lucky for literally decades. I mean, that the one that comes to mind was an individual who had done extremely well, was actually uh, had a, a job, I think it was a building maintenance guy, and he was a multimillionaire until those stocks, those handful of stocks that he had that had done so well for all those years crashed. And talk about rough. That is unbelievably difficult. When you're in your 70s and you lose 80% of your net worth because you were lucky and had four stocks that made up 95% of your portfolio and two of them actually carried the entire portfolio, that's, you know, that's rough. It's hard on me to watch that happen. It's hard on me when somebody comes into my office and I see that they've got a lot of money, but it's in three or four stocks. And that's just uh, it's scary. So anyway, I'm going to talk about how not to have that happen. <laughs> Incidentally, they would have never made the returns that they've made. When you look at it, somebody who bought Amazon and held on to it in the year 2000 when it was down 95% thinks that they are a genius. <laughs> and I'm telling you, the uh, it, some people are going to win the lottery too. That doesn't mean they're geniuses. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> I will never do that, by the way. I will never make that type of return where I buy Amazon at the bottom in 2000. You know why? Because I'm not even going to try. <laughs> I have seen so many times where that just, it just doesn't work. I mean, if it does work, you're doomed. At some point in time, all stocks take really big drops, and sometimes they don't come back. Yeah. So uh, it's one of the reasons that you know diversification, that, that's where that whole concept got started, was diversifying. People have kind of learned that way back in the early 1900s. They learned out that, you know what, you should probably spread these out a little bit. <laughs> probably should not put all of your money in, in one stock. In fact, Ben Graham, who was Warren Buffett's graduate school teacher and his first employer, he worked on a fund that Ben Graham ran. Yeah, he used to hold over 100 securities, and that was way back before that was popular. I mean, that was in the early 1900s, and he managed money all the way up until, I think, the 1950s. And then he retired, and Warren Buffett then uh, left his position there and went back home and started his own funds. And so... But that guy would hold hundreds of stocks. Now, Warren Buffett says, you know, concentrate your holdings. You know, buy, you know, he said he would put all of his money in 10 stocks. I've, and, and that's fine. Uh, 10 stocks, if, if you're really good at this uh, and you're going to be extremely selective, and you're an excellent investor, and there's always an element of luck. I don't care who you are. Yeah, there's always an element of luck. And uh, that's one way of investing. And that's, in, that's called investing, by the way. When you're going in and looking at company a company's cash flow, how much cash that company actually generates, and then you're coming up with the value of what you think that's worth, and then you're buying that stock because you think it's it's undervalued and you're going to hang on to it for a very long time, that's called value investing. And Warren Buffett's probably the most famous because he's probably been the most successful value investor. When he got to his size, incidentally, you know, if, if Warren Buffett had been running a fund, a mutual fund, or a, uh, any other type of private fund, there's a pretty good chance, if it was open to the public, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, if he was running a public fund, there's a pretty good chance nobody would know who he is because the he wouldn't be allowed to do a lot of the things that he did. He was a partnership, and then he became a holding company. And uh, long story short, we'll spend some time talking about things that the average person should be doing um, kind of like the diversification thing. That's where when you're looking at stocks, bonds, cash, basically, those are the three big categories. I know the academics love to throw in there. Well, what about real assets? Yeah, those are things like gold and you know commodities. Go look at the uh, price of corn or the price of, of crude oil and uh, price of gold. You know, gold was 800 bucks an ounce when I was 16. You know, I'm, that was a long time ago. <laughs> so uh, 
those things I'm not a huge fan of. Um, having said that, I did make a big real estate investment you know, lately, uh, mainly because the conditions around that might actually uh, prove to be very good over the next 10 to 15 years. So bottom line is you've got, for most people, most people are actually overweight real estate, by the way, because of the value of, the, of their home and what uh, that contributes to their net worth. Now, not everybody, but I would say minimally 50% of people in the country ha- are overweighted in real assets because of the value of their home relative to the rest of their portfolio. So that's why I don't talk about that. You know? And real estate is a business. If you're going to invest in real estate, it's a real business. Ask anybody that's invested that manages their own properties. It's a business. They have to spend a lot of time working, a lot of time in court, uh, a lot of time talking to contractors. It's, it, it's a business. So if you're looking at businesses or uh, investments that you can make where you're not actively working in the business, then basically today you've got stocks, bonds, and cash. Um, I just lost my whole train of thought there. <laughs> So it's how you actually put those together uh, in retirement that's going to determine the the type of lifestyle you'll have uh, given the value of income you can generate from your investments. And trying to get that as close to your risk tolerance as you possibly can. And and, uh, boy, I'm really getting off on a a lot of different subjects today. It's uh, that is a whole another ball of wax. We'll come back to that at some point in time later. Because what I really wanted to talk today, is, uh, talk about a little bit for the economic portion, is this thing called fusion. Fusion, uh, here's the definition I got from Google. Fusion power, and actually not f- just fusion, but fusion power. Fusion power is a proposed form of power generation that would generate electricity by using heat from nuclear fusion reactions. In a fusion process, two lighter atomic nuclei combine to form a heavier, a heavier nucleus while releasing energy. Devices designed to harness this energy is known as fusion reactors. Okay. This is, I've been reading about this for decades. And I guess when I first started reading about it, they said it was about 40 years away, and that would be about 20 years ago. <laughs> and it looks like it might be more like 5 to 10 years away. So it may come a little quicker than um, people have been anticipating for an extremely long time period. Right now, it's not viable but they get closer, a little closer every day. Uh, China just built a reactor and not only caught up, but but passed a lot of other uh, countries in the world, America being one of them, as far as some of the uh, goals that they were trying to hit. And this is a very real uh, subject that's having an impact on worldwide economies. Not, not huge, it's actually very small today. It's going to be large if what they are able to do uh, actually comes to fruition. And that is huge. I mean, when you talk about growth, and here's where growth is coming from the economy uh, in America. Uh, Well, a big portion of it. And it's called our grid, the electric grid. They're rebuilding it. They have to rebuild a lot of it. A lot of it's really old, incidentally. And you've got these new technologies coming online. You've got fusion. You've got solar. You've got wind. You've got um, a couple other things vying for some attention that uh, don't really get a a lot of attention right now. It may in the future. Uh, Actually, there's a company out there called Bloom Energy, if you want to learn more about that. Uh, Their symbol is actually BLUM. It's publicly traded. And so there are a lot of things happening in the space of electricity and it, that are driving and are going to continue to drive an enormous amount of growth. I mean, think about this. Remember how the Internet affected everything. Now, for all you 20-year-olds out there or anybody that just graduated from college, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about because you were actually in diapers or waiting to be born when the Internet was actually growing at rates that we haven't seen since the late 90s. And that's when all that happened, was the late 90s. Yeah. Uh, all the recent college graduates weren't even born. <laughs> that just blows my mind. I just, uh, I can't believe how old I am. 
<laughs> so anyway, what happened was everybody got all excited about this thing called the Internet. People didn't have access to it. They were building it out. You know, can you imagine not having access to your Internet, not having cell phones who uh, go over the Internet or be able to post your videos, not watch your TikToks? That didn't exist. And so you could see where it is now. And so when I'm looking out into the future and saying, hey, where, where is this going? Well, actually, our entire grid is being worked on right now. It's going to be replaced. But if I were a kid, I would become an electrician. No sweat. And uh, I don't care what kind of uh, di diploma you would get. I Actually, not diploma. I would just go to the uh, union. Say, hey, train me. And uh, if you want to be an electrical engineer, that there's going to be a lot of work needed there too. But if you didn't want to go to a four-year college and you know have to study a lot of subjects that you're never going to use again, uh, and a, a practical application of that would be an electrician. And I'm telling you, this is this is more exciting than anything that I've seen during my lifetime. It's bigger than the internet. Why? Well, because you need electricity to run the internet. Does that make sense? <laughs> you need electricity to run the internet. Electricity is, is more widely used than the internet is. I know that's probably astounding people. In fact, I can see a whole bunch of millennials out there. I mean, not the millennials. They're, they're actually getting a little smarter. Um, but what's that group right before the millennials? I'll have to look that up during the commercial break. <laughs> anyway, you're listening to Bill Bullington right here on 1420. Stay tuned because I will be right back. And it's lasting all week long Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song oh, I heard your heart I see your pain Out in the dark Out in the rain you're so alone, you're so afraid. I heard you pray in Jesus' name. It may be midnight or midday. It's never early, never late. He gon' stand by what he claimed. I lived enough life to say. Help is on the way, round in the corner. And we're back. Hey, you're listening to Bill Bullington. If you hear anything you'd like more information on, just feel free to go to my website. It's bullingtoncapital.com. There's a contact us page there. You can type in your question, send it to me, and I will try to get back to you as quickly as I possibly can. Um, we were talking a little bit about what was going to shape the future of the economy. It's actually shaping it now. This, this is not really something that's going to be happening in the future. It, it, it's going to continue to happen in the future because this is going on right now. They're, they're rebuilding the grid. I, I've got these pictures, and I'm going. I'm trying to search on Google. I took them with my phone. They're these huge pieces of electrical equipment that are being hauled all over the highways. I know because I drive a lot. And I've got these pictures, and I'm trying to find out what they are. It looks like something space age. They're gigantic. I'm sure it's electrical. And I would really love to find out exactly what it is. But it just reminds me of how much work there is to do to get the grid up into shape. And that, that's a really good thing. Why? Well, because it means jobs. It means high-paying jobs. And it means that the economy will continue to grow, and it's going to be boosted by that. And again, electricity is in almost everything we do. I mean, think about your house. How many things, when the electric goes out, how lost are you? Think about that for a second. When your electricity goes out, how lost are you? That unfortunate circumstance that happened in texas last year was horrible so and, and we need to rebuild that stuff they shouldn't have the wires up above the ground for one thing they should be underground as as often as possible uh, is that cheap nope <laughs> that's really expensive so and this is my point we need a lot of work and a lot of the work is being done and money's being spent there and when you spend money the people that are are getting paid have to buy clothing, they have to wear shoes, they have to buy cars, live in housing, eat food. The entire economy grows from that. And that is a really good thing. So 
if you're looking out over the next 10 to 20 years, I am extremely relaxed because I see that we are moving in directions that are good in the long run for the economy. As far as investing goes, the market's going to be volatile, extremely volatile. What you've seen is, is going to continue uh, going forward. That's, and it's always been that way, incidentally. The market has never been calm. The only people that think the market has been calm are people who are uh, extremely old and their memory is not working so well. Uh, anybody that's paid any, any attention to it at all or close attention to it understands that markets fluctuate a lot. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's the way they work. It's the way it's going to work. And it can work for you. If you're getting too close to retirement to be able to suffer those swings, and you know that's a very real possibility, if you have too much money invested in stocks while you're taking money out of your account, you can end up really hurting yourself financially. And that, that, that's where the balancing act comes in. How much money would be a good percentage to have in stocks versus bonds? Well, that depends on your age and how much money you plan to take out of it. If you're not taking any money out of it, well, you can be more aggressive. And that's one of the reasons that I just can't give a one-size-fits-all solution for everybody. It just doesn't work. It, there's, there's no one size fits all. Actually, there was at one point in time, the Cleveland Clinic had triple tax free bonds that paid 12%. Now that, <laughs> if that ever comes back, you can bet. <laughs> can you imagine that? 12, by the way, the clinic, Cleveland Clinic was considered risky. That's why they had to pay 12% triple tax free. They were risky. And uh, yeah, <laughs> my producer's in there going, <laughs> looking at me with disbelief. Now I'm really telling you my age, man. When I was there, the, this guy came in. He had these bonds from the Cleveland Clinic. His were actually 9%. Okay, so he had purchased them a few years later after interest rates had come down. But 9% triple tax free is huge. I mean, think about that. What's the taxable equivalent yield? In other words, what would you have to get in a CD to be left with 9% after taxes, it depends on your tax bracket, but probably somewhere around 12 or 12 to 14%, somewhere in that neighborhood, depending on, again, your tax bracket. So, And those were uh, guaranteed by the Cleveland Clinic. Now, the reason the clinic had to pay so much again is because people were worried about them. They were a hospital, and hospital bonds, hospital systems had a tendency to go broke from time to time. Uh, so anyway, that was in those days. Boy, I had a few of those now. In fact... An individual came into my office. He had a hundred thousand dollars worth of these bonds, and he was carrying them with him. And he'd already signed them to cash them in. And I was going, "Well, I can put these on deposit for you, but I am not sure I would want to cash these bonds." He goes, "Well, they're not paying anything." Oh, well, see these little things called they're called coupons. They look like a real coupon. You're supposed to clip those coupons and send them in, and then they'll send you the cash. <laughs> He hadn't been sending in his coupons. So not only did he have these bonds that were, incidentally, people would have paid a lot more than he paid for them to get them. He had never cashed in any of the interest on it. He'd had them for about 10 years. And uh, so we left. he left home that day with a uh, almost the equivalent in income in his account than he had deposited in the face amount of the bonds. <laughs> that, was a, that was a trip. So none of this stuff exists today by the way, and, uh, but the, the concepts still work the same, but they literally had coupons. When people would say, well, what's the coupon? What's the coupon rate? They were asking how much interest the bond was paying because they used to write that interest, uh, that amount of that money amount on the coupon that you would actually cut, bring into a brokerage firm somewhere. They would take it and uh, disperse the cash and you know, you'd go home with it, that money in your pocket. Uh, I would have always recommended that you kept the bonds on deposit at the brokerage firm and just let them put the money in your account. That was a smart thing to do uh, because that way you don't go for 10 years without getting any money back thinking that these bonds are broken. <laughs> they were no good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was that's pretty wild. So anyway, the financial services have always been kind of confusing. I try to keep it as simple as I possibly can. Uh, it's not that that I don't like these things, I like them. I mean, that was that was a, a great find for that guy. And uh, 
putting that in an account for him so that he would actually get his interest payments from, from then on and not have to do anything about it was a, was a great thing. I didn't get paid anything for that, by the way. In fact, he wanted to sell them, and I, I talked him out of it. Yeah, hey, don't sell these bonds. Are you kidding me? <laughs> those, are, those are great bonds. And um, so brings back a lot of memories. What it also brings back is right around that time, you know what the big technology was of that day? Cable television. That was the big technology of the day. And it did change. It changed everything. I mean, think about it. I mean, now you're probably getting internet over your cable and using streaming services. But back then, nobody had cable. You had like five total local television stations. Uh, One was UHF. The other was VHF. I I can't even remember what those things stood for. But it's three, five, and eight. ABC, NBC, CBS. Those were the main across the entire country. And then you had a couple local channels. And that was it. Five channels. And if the president was giving a speech, your night was shot. Because they were all covering the same. I, I guess if you liked politics, it was great. But I was a kid. I, I couldn't believe you. I, I had to skip watching Gilligan's Island because, <laughs> because the president was going to be giving a talk. So, But what really excites me again about what I see now, this is bigger. This is bigger than cable. It's bigger than the internet was. This affects everything. Everybody uses electricity every day, all day. And it's mind-boggling how large this is and what kind of uh, job security that's going to be for so many industries. And the people that are working in those industries, by the way, they're going to do extremely well. People in tech, they're going to do extremely well. Medical, that's going to do extremely well. They're all going to benefit from all the progress that's being made in these areas and all those people buy clothing, eat food, live in housing and have transportation. So again, the entire economy, if you don't know where to invest, just buy a broadly diversified portfolio. Just make sure you have small, medium, large cap international emerging market and uh, spread it out because trying to predict which ones are going to do the best over the next 12 months? You might as well try to predict how much, how many points the Browns are going to score in the fifth game uh, in their first quarter. That's what you're, uh, that's literally about the same level of difficulty. So, but you can bet that a long term portfolio that's well diversified with all this stuff that's going on, not just here, it's going on everywhere. I mean, every time you turn around, China is actually catch it up to us or, or one up in us in, in some area of technology. And uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing because as soon as they figure out something, you know, we're going to copy it. <laughs> that's what they've been doing to us for <laughs> forever. So uh, turnabout's fair play and that that's okay. That, that's progress is still made. And so I'm very enthusiastic for the 40 year olds, anybody 40 or under anybody 45 or under very enthusiastic for you. You get closer to 50 or 60, you have to be a little bit more careful. And that's where those fixed index annuities came in. That's, that's kind of what I was tying that into because the only other op, uh, option are, are going to be bonds or CDs, and they're paying nothing. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's okay to have them, and they're there to keep your whole portfolio from fluctuating 50% you know, from top to bottom or, or more. That's what bonds are there for, to try to, to mitigate some of that risk. If you're nearing retirement and you're going to start taking money out over the next four to five years, you should not be 100% in stocks. So the alternatives are really crappy interest rate bonds. And it, the interest rates are very low. Or you could take a combination and use something like the fixed index annuity that we've been talking about. They offer a much higher rate of income than you're going to get on CDs. It's not like a CD, though. A CD, you can cash it in and get your money back. Most of these have um, restrictions, so you've got to know. But sometimes the restrictions are worth having if the return is going to be high enough. And that, that's kind of a big deal. So I'm looking at a, uh, in fact, when I go to commercial break, I'll, when we come back, I'll have an, uh, uh, an example of what type of income at what ages somebody might be able to get. And I'll just look that up during that, that break. But it's extremely competitive uh, for an income. It's going to give you some guarantees on your principal that you can't get with other types of investments. I think that's a big deal. 
uh, especially if you have beneficiaries, people that you care about. If you don't have people that you care about, who cares? You know, the uh, it, it, the benefit's still there. It's not like you you can take it away. But the uh, um, it's got return of principal guarantees that that a lot of other investments just don't have. So I think it's a very good option to to consider. I think stocks, you know, diversified portfolio is a very good option. I mean, especially for almost everybody should have somebody where if you're in your 80s and you're extremely conservative, I still think you should probably have like maybe a, a 75, 25% mix between 75% fixed income uh, and then 25% in funds. I think that would be a, a good mix. And that you don't have to be in your 80s if you were just extremely conservative. If you said, hey, I just don't want to take a whole lot of risk. I don't have a lot of faith in the stock market. Um, and I'd like to take as much money and put it into the fixed category as possible. Okay, and that's fine. And that's what I was alluding to earlier. There's no one right way. There is a right way for you, though. Uh, there's something that, you know, if you sit down with an advisor and try to figure out what kind of investor are you really, how much risk can you really take? And here's the, the process. This is how easy it is. You know, I see all these questionnaires by all these firms and Everybody answers all the questions. Nobody understands what the questions really meant, and they don't understand the answers, and they just kind of, uh, well, I guess you want to know what you're doing, and it sounds good. All right, well, that's one way of doing it. Uh, another way would be, you know, if you saw the, the entire portfolio value drop by 50%, would you still be able to sleep at night? And most people are going to say no, and I'm going to say no. I'm too old for that now. I don't want to see a 50% drop again. So what does that mean? It means I can't put all of my money in the stock market because the stock market's been down 50% more than once, I think four times during my lifetime. And it took several years to recover every time that happened. Now, that's not a problem if you're in your 40s. That's not a problem if you're in your 50s, your early 50s. Uh, It is a problem if you're 10 years away from retirement because you don't want to go 10 years like the market did from 2000. Uh, up to 2010 and show a slightly negative return. Think about that. 10 years, slightly negative return. You can't afford that at that point in time. So the the other solutions are put some of the money in a fixed or guaranteed account, not worry about it. Boy, I wish I had those Cleveland Clinic bonds again. <laughs> but since those don't exist, here's the, uh, the next best thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then you're going to take some of your money, you're going to put it into diversified stock portfolios. Um, we try to make ours a little bit different. I try to overweight a couple sectors that I think are, are going to do better. Um, there's no guarantee that that's actually going to work out. It uh, Generally, stocks have a tendency to keep up with the increase in sales and profit margins over time. So normally what I'm doing is looking at what's happening right now, understanding that I can't predict the future, at least not accurate, uh, super accurately. But if I observe what's going on right now, I'm going to invest and overweight those sectors who are growing the fastest today, especially if I understand the reasoning behind the growth. You know, you've heard me talk about semiconductor industry for an extremely long time period. Look how well that's done since I started talking about that. Why? Because their revenues were growing 40% year over year. Ford had to slow down production on their cars because of the shortages in semiconductors. And it, is it still a good category? Yeah. Is it as good as it was when I first started talking about it? No, it's up over 100%. The, uh, but it's still a good one. I hear the music. That means i got to take a real quick commercial break. You're listening to Bill Bullington right here on 1420. Stay tuned because that will be right back. In the dark and all alone Growing comfortable Are you too scared to move and walk out of this tomb? Buried underneath the lies that you believed Safe and sound, stuck in the ground, too lost to be found You're just asleep And it's time to leave Come on and ride I've been running in circles, jumping the hurdles, getting caught in that rush of doing so much. I'm feeling kind of worn out. All this checking the boxes, 
Trying to be thoughtless Has me spinning my head Catching my breath Too afraid to slow it down I tell and myself And we're back You remember uh, When Danny Goki was on uh, American Idol so That stuff's still up on YouTube all right, well, now we're coming up this section of my program, which I'm going to do this every week from now on, is I'm going to talk about individual stocks. Now, why am I doing this? Well, because it gets kind of under your skin when you've been doing it for so long. I can't do this for individual clients uh, anymore. Uh, to do an individual stock portfolio that I personally manage, I just have too many clients to be able to do that, and the market moves too fast. So I'm doing the next best thing. I actually put up uh, a website and I uh, got Mike Seeger to run it for me. It, he's running the scans that I run every day to, to pick my stocks from. That site is called Lookout for the Bull. Mike is the sole owner of that right now. Um, I transferred all the ownership over to him. And I taught him how to run the scans. Uh, he does a great job. That's called lookoutforthebull.com. And I go through these scans for my own personal portfolio. And it's roughly, it's 20% of my money. Okay, it's roughly about 20% of my money. And I don't think anybody should be doing much more than that. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, now, this is America, and you're free to do whatever you'd like to do. But my personal opinion is, if you're going to manage individual stocks, you probably shouldn't do much more than 20%, unless you are extremely sophisticated and have a lot of time on your hands. <laughs> Then, yeah, you could do more than 20%. But for the rest of us, that 20%, by the way, it, it can make a big difference in the long run in your portfolio and even your lifestyle. So having said that, I'm going to go down the list of stocks that, that came up on these scans within the last few days that I think are uh, very attractive, not only from a valuation standpoint, but the chart pattern itself. And, and again, if you want to figure out how you should do this, I would go to lookoutforthebull.com. It'll give you some idea as to why I'm talking about these stocks. Uh, you can just read the uh, training material there. The training material is, is really all there is, quite frankly. And the thing that you really need to pay attention to is called the 1% rule. Having said all that, the first stock I'm going to is United Natural Foods. And its symbol is UNFI. Um, right now, and this is a 15 minute lag, by the way, it's $40.94. And if you wanted to see, if you, if you wondered what William O'Neill was talking about when he said cup and handle pattern, this is a cup and handle pattern. So if you don't know what that means, don't bother looking it up. It's not worth your time. <laughs> but, but he was really popular for a long time marketing that particular pattern. And this would qualify as that. Uh, let's see, I'm going to go down a lot of oil and gas stocks. Again, I've been mentioning have been coming up and some that I guess these I'll just mention really quickly. I, I don't, I haven't looked into them super closely, but they've got super low valuations and their stocks are running right now. One of them is Plains Group Holdings. P-A-G-P is a symbol right now. It's like $11 and 75 cents. So that one looks pretty good. Uh, and I'm just looking at the charts, by the way, I'm not looking at the underlying companies that much. Now this one, I'm looking at the underlying company a little bit. This is big five sporting goods. You know, it's kind of like a, a competitor to Dick's sporting goods in, um, its symbol is B G F V that's boy, George, Frank, Victor. And it's price right now is $34 and nine cents. It had this huge one day range. And I, I feel bad. I didn't talk about it you know, a couple weeks ago because it had this gigantic surge which is a classic breakout pattern. And it's very hard for a lot of people to buy because it was a 52-week high. The, the stock closed in the upper 25% of that day's range. Uh, the volume was huge. Very, very difficult for the average person to buy because they've, you know, they've always heard that you know, it, whatever goes up has come right back down. And eventually they all come down. But since that time period, the stock is up 36%. <laughs> I mean, that's just a, just a couple weeks. So sometimes it'll do that in a day. That's why I like my pattern. And I am writing a little tiny booklet on this because it really doesn't take much more knowledge than that. Uh, 
the, the my favorite pattern. And kind of like the William O'Neill, he liked that cup and handle pattern. I like that one too. Um, but as, as you do this, if you do this enough for enough time, you'll find out that you will be attracted to certain patterns that you're going to recognize. If you really like the stock market, you shouldn't be spending more than uh, an hour a day at the most looking at this stuff. That, that should be at the most. And if you do it consistently over time, what's going to happen is you're going to notice patterns that show up in the movement. At first, a lot of the patterns are going to be imaginary. (laughs) Uh, It'll take you a while. You'll be doing this for a couple of years, but eventually you'll look at something and go, oh, that looks good. Yeah. Why? Because you've seen it before and then you saw what happened after that. Okay. So that's where the big five sporting goods comes from, BGFV. And by the way, if that stock goes down 10% from my purchase price, I am out. See ya. 10% from my purchase price, gone. Why? Because statistically, the stocks that meet all these criteria, if they drop 10% from my purchase price, they have a tendency not to be a good stock in the long run. And I'd rather get out earlier than later. Who wants to hang on to a stock for six months just to get stopped out at a price that was lower than you could have got out six months ago? So you have to, <laughs> you have to think about that. By the way, this is, uh, this is what's known as trading, and this is trend trading. Again, I, I'm going to remind everybody, there are investors. That's what Warren Buffett does. There are traders. I do that. what my favorite part is. My investing part, I use funds for that. And then there are gamblers. Those are the three participants in the stock market. You've got investors, professional traders, and then you have gamblers. And if you can't explain exactly why you're, be- you're buying or selling a stock, guess which category you're in? <laughs> you are the gambler. Most gamblers die broke. The vast majority of them die broke. And by the way, there are professional gamblers. Those will be more similar to traders. They try to, to come up with uh, an estimate of the probabilities, and then they play when the probabilities are in their favor. So trading uh, and professional gambling have a lot in common. The average gambler ends up losing money. That's why Las Vegas has such nice hotels. <laughs> so anyway, uh, going down my list here, uh, this is kind of interesting because the uh, market's actually open while I'm doing this. And a lot of the stocks market must be down a little bit because most of the stocks are down just a little bit, which is good for you. But uh, here's one. Th- this one is called MoneyGram International. Uh, they send money all over the world. I like that business because I can understand that business. The uh, price of sales ratio is very low on it. Um, yesterday, the volume was about 150% of its average daily volume. It closed in the top 10% of that day's range. That's my pattern. That, that's what I like. And I've been in and out of that stock for yeah, probably since I started investing. Originally, I bought it as an investment. It got overpriced and I sold it. And by the time I had purchased it again, it was because it, it came up on one of these scans. And I've never bought and held it. I always bought it and had a trailing stop on it, which is a good thing. Because when I look back at where this stock was in 2006, MoneyGram International was $265 a share. Well, it's at $10.75 a share today. That's one of those stocks that I was talking about earlier. People buy and hold. That is unbelievably risky. Unbelievably risky especially if you don't know anything about financial statements. Because you, if you're going to be a, like a Warren Buffett type of value investor, where you're going to buy stocks that you think are undervalued, you have to know how to value a stock. And by the way, you're going to be surprised a lot. And this is a classic reason why I'm not a big fan of buying and holding. I bought stuff and held on to it for several years, but that was because it was undervalued and it stayed undervalued. I was also reminded of this when I looked at Nucor the other day. Nucor is a steel company that came up on a scan, uh, has come up several times recently. Uh, all throughout the 90s, I think it, that's, that stock peaked in 1994. Didn't get above that peak level until 2004, so 10 years later, and it stayed down 50 60% all that time. By the way, Warren Buffett had owned that stock for a long time, and I was looking at why is he owning, why, why does he want a steel stock? Well, anyway, 
it's uh it goes up from that point in 2008 the stock peaked at 83 bucks okay it peaked at 83 bucks in 2008 so here we go over to 2020 and it's down to 27 think about that for a second i mean you want to talk about you got to have the patience of job for that <laughs> and i've always known that he's owned that stock and i've always watched what it's doing and if he still got it, well, guess what? The stock's at 104 today. So kudos, Mr. Buffett. <laughs> if you still own the stock, I think you still do. I got, I'd i have to go look at the end report and see that. But anyway, it came up again today. I'm not sure I would be buying it now. but uh, And if I bought it, it would be as a trade. Here's a, I have 60 seconds left, so I'm going to give you International Gaming Technology. The symbol is IGT. The... Uh, uh, it's a $25 a share, twenty five oh five as we're talking about this. That's getting close to its all-time high of 30 bucks that it reached back in 2018. And by the way, during the crash of this year, that thing got down to a couple dollars a share. <laughs> Holy cow. Again, that's the reason that I have an incredibly tough time buying and holding stocks. I'll buy and hold a fund, no sweat, because the fund is actually being managed by the math that runs the fund, an algorithm. It's an exchange-traded fund. Yeah, that that's not a problem. But individual stocks, not so much. There was another one, Extreme Networks, EXTR is the symbol on that. It's $11.21 right now. Has a relatively low price to sales ratio. Um, they used to be, I don't know if they still do, but used to be a competitor to like Cisco Systems. I'm not sure if they are or not. I remember this stock back in the late 90s, got up to 100 bucks a share. Now it's coming up on my momentum scan at eleven dollars a share. Another reason I don't buy and hold. Yeah, I mean that's beyond the life expectancies of an awful lot of people in this, <laughs> in this country. Uh, oh no, I hear the music. I'll give you the, this is the last one. This stock just came public last October. This is McAfee Software Company. You probably recognize them if you're a kid or if you're in IT. Uh, actually, if you're under the age of uh, sixty-five, you might you probably know who they are. Anyway, there are software companies. Symbol is MCFE. The price is $25.66. Price to sales ratio is relatively low, especially for a software company. So thanks for listening, everybody. This is Bill Bullington. You can get me at my website, bullingtoncapital.com. I'm here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon. Have a good week, good luck, and good investing. You just caught another edition of the Bullington Capital Report, broadcasting every Saturday at 11 a.m. on AM 1420, The Answer. If you have a question and you'd like to speak to Bill personally, you can call him at 330-664-0700. That's 330-664-0700. Or online at BullingtonCapital.com. That's BullingtonCapital.com. The preceding program has been paid for by Bullington Capital Management, LLC.